And he has a great mustache. I imagine that was probably yeah. an important. No, the, the mustache was his. It's not my my. It wasn't <laughs> a character building. We actually discussed if we were gonna uh, chop the mustache off, but it would look too young. He's actually, I think, Nuno is in his thirties. Uh, but without the mustache, he showed me a photo. It looked like Nuno was twenty. So okay, no, definitely not. <laughs> Hey everyone, this is David Stark from Watcher Pass. Today I'm joined by Carlos Amaral, the writer and director of Infinite Sea, which came to theaters on March 10th, 2023, and is coming to Amazon on March 24th, 2023. We're going to talk to him right now, and while you're watching, if you can like and subscribe to this channel, that would be fantastic. I'll spend a lot. Thank you. So thanks so much for joining me. This is Carlos Amaral, the writer, director of Infinite Sea. He also is uh, a visual effects artist on the film, and I think he edited and colorized it. He kind of did everything for this I, movie, I didn't, which I, I loved. I, I thought it was fantastic. I love the style. I love the slow storytelling. Uh, I just loved everything about this movie. So I'm very excited to talk to him. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Uh, yes, I, I, the only thing I didn't fully do was edit. Uh, so I did some of the editing, but most of the editing was done by an editor uh, other than me. The rest, yes, I did. it was almost a one-man film. But uh, I did have a, an amazing crew to work with, uh, an amazing musician, uh, great cinematographer, great cast, and uh, my crew was amazing. So without them, this would not be possible. That's, I, I mean, yeah, I'm amazed at the number of hats you wore, but I'm also glad that you had a great crew also to help relieve some of that burden. It sounds like there was a lot on you, but uh, it, it definitely feels, feels like a team effort, so... Yeah, it is. It's uh, because I work with them as a visual effects artist, you know, color grader. So this is my crew. So it's a crew I know from other films that are not my film. So you, they're not really like uh, under me. They're we are a very horizontal crew in that in that sense. So it's uh, they're friends. That is awesome. And so. I looked at your bio. You, you've done a ton of visual effects work. It sounds like you've worked with this crew for a while. You haven't done yeah. a lot of directing. So what was the kind of, what was the impetus for, you know, I guess we'll start with the writing part of it. What was the impetus for the writing this film? Like what inspired the story? So um, so the the idea for this film, this, I first wrote it, wrote it as a short film uh, back in 2010. So this was in, inspired by the, the, the idea of immigrating. So after the 2008 crisis, Portugal had a really rough time. So this is, uh, around the time I was starting my career, so most of my friends just left, uh, and not because they were starving or anything, but just because there was no pros prospect of a better life, and you just left. Mm -hmm. And this gave me a, a, the idea of, oh, okay, what if everybody leaves? What's left? Uh, and this came the seed that became the idea for the story, so this uh, grew into something else, and... I didn't get funding for the short film, and uh, I did other short films uh, after that. I also directed a long, for a long time advertising, and I directed television also. Um, but then I became, I started doing VFX, and I had time to write, so I started writing again, and I decided to write it as a feature, and that's what happened. That is that is awesome. I love that you kind of like stayed with the story for. A long time like it must have like still affected you and kept you know being a part of your life or at least a part of something you were thinking about and unfortunately it feels like immigration is still kind of an issue throughout maybe it's not as bad as it, in portugal as it was in 2010 but it still feels like the tensions of immigration and people leaving and or resettling are still kind of yeah uh, I, modern themes so yeah i don't think it's as, as bad as it was but we did have a big brain drain as we call it uh, mostly because we had a mass immigration in the 60s um, due to poverty, but now it's mostly uh, co uh, college graduates leaving for better jobs. That was just it. And you had the, the best of the best, the youngest and the smartest leaving, which is pretty sad, but we manage. Yeah, no, and um, you know the thing that I know most about Portugal leaving is, is all the players that leave to go to like the Premier League and the... Uh... The, yeah, the... but those those don't, I think players who can't complain. We actually have a pretty competitive uh, uh, league, so it's still uh, my team. Is my I'm a fan of a team that's still in the Champions League in the final eight teams. So, oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they, still, they still compete. Uh, the, the the funny thing is, I think probably one of the mo the biggest growing uh, Im immigrant uh, immigrant community is now uh, Americans. They're moving here in droves. Now you go to any bar here in Porto. I live in Porto, which is north of Portugal. It, hmm. it, what you listen to is American. They're all Americans. I mean, don't. I, I went to Portugal years ago, and I definitely wanted to move there as well. To see if 
was a move in a beautiful yeah. country um, so. just just don't overpay for the housing because that's what you're doing basically <laughs> just don't, don't well, overpay it, for the housing yeah that, that is definitely uh that is definitely a concern when that happens <laughs> yeah um so i guess how long did it take to to flesh out the short story into a feature and then how long after that did it take to get this actual film made because it's it feels like uh, it was a actually, process you know to yeah. get to there yeah, it was a it was pretty quick actually because uh, I actually pitched the idea to to the producer who was my friend uh, and I didn't have it written yet. I told him I had it, but I didn't. <laughs> so I just came up with a uh, like a forty page script in a month or something, and then probably two more two more to just to write a full story. Um, and then it took us a year to fund it. Usually, when you you hear it. The, 99% of films are government funding. So you basically have no other option. Mm -hmm. So when you get government funding, you still have to wait one year to get the, the actual funding. And then still, because our production had, our production company had so many features to, to be made. I had to wait one more year. So I actually got this funded. I uh, applied in 2015, got funding in 2016, shot in 2018. And then we were supposed to release early 2020, but <laughs> That was a bad idea because COVID <laughs> came and then we just had to delay everything. Oh, well, well, so it was a journey, but that, that sounds like, uh, not as, not as long of a process I was expected, uh, given. No, uh, it's, it, for me, it's, it's insane because I, I, I'm, this for me is old. So it's new for you, probably for somebody like you who just watched it. But for me, this is a very old idea. Uh, so, um, I'm glad now that's finally reaching people. So, but for me, it took a, it took an eternity. That's well, I'm glad that you stuck through it because, like I said, I, I love this movie. Uh, one thing I'm Thanks. wondering: your, your English is fantastic, and I loved how, like, watching this film. I was watching the original soundtrack with subtitles, and like, it was very easy to follow. Was there any kind of thought uh, on the English language when you were writing this, or did you write it purely in Portuguese um, and just kind of translate it after? No, I didn't. I, I well, I I do talk a lot in English because I teach. Also, I'm also a teacher, so I usually have uh, in a college. So I usually have foreign students. Uh, it's pretty common here. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have I teach mostly in English. Uh, but uh, my my cinematic thinking it is is a bit in English. I do watch a lot of American uh, cinema uh, in English also. Um, so and most of the fiction we have on cable is is American. So if you if you um go through uh 50 channels they mostly will, will be in, uh, american channels or american content so we get that a lot so most portuguese speak english and it's just part of our cinematic uh imagination i believe mm -hmm. but i didn't if i did it it was uh unintentional i think it's probably easy to follow because mostly it's a visual film it's not a, a drama uh built up built up with dialogue it's mostly made of visuals and music and ideas that you can I think you can almost get the same idea if you didn't sp even uh, speak the language or had subtitles. I think it, it's just there. I yeah, think. I think some of the nuances you wouldn't get, but uh, definitely like the general story you would get and the mood. Like the mood was perfectly conveyed through the visuals and the music. So I definitely agree there. Um, that's a perfect transition to uh, the style. I loved kind of the the way this film like represented the future. It was almost like it it, it felt like a little bit past but also futuristic because it had like a very kind of modern aesthetic with old technology that had just kind of like updated so how did you come up with the style was this always how you envisioned it or was no it just kind of... not at all i i <laughs> uh, at first uh first when i i thought of, of this it would be futuristic but then um when i started to actually uh, write it knowing that probably it would reach the screen uh it it looked cheesy in my mind. I don't know. It it looked. Uh, I I just imagined like those cheap sci-fi films mm -hmm. that look like cheap sci-fi. So I was like, okay, I would never have enough money to actually build something visually amazing. So I thought, why not uh, use what I have, which is old um, computers. So I went into some some idea of retro sci-fi. Not mm -hmm. only that, but also because uh, some of my references that I was rewatching at a time, like Alien, the computers are old, but they still look amazing. Uh, I don't know. It, I think it's because computers look magical up for me to me at that time, because they were so um, they were very limited. But I didn't since I didn't really understand what they could do. They they, they look magic, so I thought maybe the technology could look uh, like that. So. 
that's why I, I built those uh, DOS uh, interface. Um, it's mostly post -pro it's post production. It's all done in, in After Effects. But still, I had this idea of, of everything being old and retro because of production issues, but also because I, I think it just I know it looked better. No, and I, also, oh, yes, go ahead. Sorry, sorry. Also because um, uh, I don't know if you've been to Porto, but Porto is an old city. It's a very old city. I try to to uh, not show that part of the city people most like, which is like really uh, like uh, medieval or uh, 17th century or 16th century buildings. So I wanted it to look like a, a, an ugly city. So that's why I I removed all uh, uh, any aspect of nature in the city. So all trees are removed from in post production. So we don't have any nature besides the water. So this is just basically the ugliness of our architecture and what's left of us in old uh, technology. So the idea is that humanity is basically putting all all in and going away, mm -hmm. and what's left behind is just what's not good anymore. Yeah, no, and I 100% agree. I thought that like when you with the classic looking computers with kind of a, a space race theme, it definitely feels more timeless. Like if, if you would have tried to make it super sci-fi, like the effects just wouldn't have, they, they probably wouldn't have looked right. And they also wouldn't stand the test of time. What I love about this is that years from now, it'll still look good because you don't really mm -hmm. rely on effects that are going to look dated. It's just kind of like old classic technology that's doing something amazing. Yeah, yeah. I, I actually did a test with one of those cheesy uh, transparent screens that every every <laughs> single sci-fi film has been using since uh, Minority Report, and mm -hmm. it looks so horrible. Oh my god, this looks so cheesy. That's when I really decide, okay, now we have to go somewhere else. I did have this idea before, but I didn't think it would work, but it did. We tried out a few tests, and it did work. Yeah, no, it, it reminded me a lot of uh, Gattaca. I don't know if you've seen that film, but that's one of my favorites of all time. Oh, what? It, Sorry? It's a similar. Uh, a Gattaca? It's a... Gattaca, of course. It's yeah. my reference, of course. One of my references is... Yeah, so. no, I, it's one of my favorite films of all time. And, like, just the, the, the similarities were perfect because that also had older technology but still had a futuristic feel to it. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. I, I Actually, I watched it after I wrote the film. Uh, I haven't I had watched it a long time ago, but I didn't actually remember it that well. But when I rewatched it, oh my god, it was like this. My film is an imitation, is <laughs> a cheap imitation of Gattaca. <laughs> I panicked, no. but well, I was done by that time, so <laughs> it was not going back. <laughs> Inspired by yeah, no, it, it it had similarities, but very very different stories. But I just I yeah, love yeah, that yeah. kind of like classic yeah, but, feel because I can yeah, go back and does... watch. Okay. Yeah, but it does have two people looking into to the sky, looking at rockets going away. Yeah, I but, think uh, that's, you know. <laughs> that's very similar. Yeah, but, but it's, a, it's a space drama. They're all going to have yeah. rockets going yeah, it away. Is. It is, it is. <laughs> um, and so uh, the other thing I love is like, you talked about shooting these urban scenes. And I, I thought that the urban scenes were beautiful. Like this, the, the concrete kind of massive concrete jungle, essentially with no um, plants. I thought that was actually a really striking aspect of it. But how did you get them to be so empty? Because I thought that that was amazing. You have these sprawling cities that feel like there's no life was that after effects was that uh did you film no, at actually night? Uh, those shots were well, basically but we shot at night okay. so if you shoot at night you'll get an empty city so uh unlike it, this city has what uh it, the the big area the metropolitan we call it the metropolitan area will have like a million people but the center will have like two hundred thousand people which is not a lot it's a small city so if you shoot at night if you run away from the obvious places where you have like nightlife it will be empty so it's not that hard um i actually thought of reshooting the, some of this stuff during the pandemic but i would by that time i was so tired of the film <laughs> i didn't have the courage to go back and we actually didn't need the footage but uh because what you see is mostly from above um, but I did want to hide the identity of the city. It's supposed to be a, an unnamed city in an unnamed place. Uh, and I think I got away with that because even people who live here don't identify the city. In actual, actually, it's shot in very uh, central places. Uh, his bedroom is actually in the dead center of the city. That's the main square of the city. Oh, wow. So what you see behind it's like you see like a clock tower behind it's it's the it's the city hall so that's the, the center <laughs> of the city so uh, but you I you, I still people can identify it but that's what I wanted yeah no perfect it's movie magic <laughs> yeah um and the the other kind of really striking space was the uh, the Proxima Centauri scene where did you find that place that looked so desolate but also beautiful like uh, where, yeah where that, that's that? that that we had only two choices but it, this one is pretty close it's like an hour drive away from here uh if you look at the uh, portugal's map uh, south of Porto, you have like a kind of a bay 
-hmm. probably you would have something like a in Florida, I don't know. We have like it's kind of a swamp. It's uh, the sea will go inside of, of the land, and you'll get this kind of swamp that will uh, rise, and uh, you have tides like just like the sea. So you really don't have any vegetation. You just have mud. <laughs> so you have mud and basically almost no horizon. You don't have, don't see anything. So you have this amazing sprawl of just uh, low land and water. So it looks amazing um, by itself. It was a challenge to film there because once you uh, you step on it, you will get sucked in. It's like it's it's a swamp, so it was super dangerous and very complicated to shoot. So, for example, uh, Nunu, the actor, sometimes when in, when he was in a shot, uh, he missed a step and would get sunk like up to his waist. And one guy would go pull him out and would get sunk also. So you have to make like a human chain to pull him out. It's, it was a nightmare. Oh my gosh! There. That yeah, and it, and it stinked. It, it smelled. <laughs> all of it. it was horrible. <laughs> Well, I, mean, I think that's that's what you're supposed to convey, right? So it's perfect. It's it's like yeah, method acting. It was, yeah, it was mud everywhere. We had mud on the camera on ourselves. It was <laughs> it was really complicated. Well, and it must be difficult because you kind of have to watch like you, where you step for both safety, but then also it's supposed to be like a you know a desolate, uninhabited planet. So you can't have a lot of footsteps around. You have to kind of probably be very careful where you step just yeah, to make sure yeah, it looks right. Yeah, uh, yeah. The, the problem were seagulls. There were a lot of seagulls we had to remove, but no, the, nobody walks uh, in those places. It's just and it's unwalkable. And we just uh, we use the low tides just to make the the scenes that you can walk on. But in the in two hours time, it will rise uh, up to your waist. So it was very dangerous to shoot on. Um, that's why we didn't get as many scenes as we wanted in uh, in the planet because mm -hmm. we were supposed to shoot more. But it was just way too complicated. <laughs> Oh, I like I like that you have fleeting instances of it, right? It makes yeah. it kind of a, a, a strange place. We, yeah, we shot it. Yeah. We shot it guerrilla style. It was very guerrilla style. So, okay, <laughs> run and okay, I'm sinking. Let's shoot this quickly, and that was it. Uh, and and you know, not to be taught by that, you also had the I imagine difficult scenes, the a lot of underwater scenes. Were those tough to film? Was that something you'd done before? Like I, I thought those uh, were also striking. I'm, uh, personally, no, but my production, my crew had done, and that it, that's a, a a tank for testing robot submarines in a university. Mm -hmm. uh, they just loaned it, lent it to us for free. It was amazing. But the water is at uh, 12 degrees centigrade, which is very cold. Ooh. So uh, Maria, the actress, went into hyperthermia. I don't know if oh you've ever gosh. seen somebody going into hyperthermia, but it's very scary. Uh, I thought she was going to die. It was really hard. Uh, Nunu, uh, because Nunu is actually was a professional swimmer. He, he was he was in competitions. You never know he doesn't swim in the film. But um, <laughs> it was very helpful because he managed to hold a, a long time. It was pretty hard. I actually wanted to shoot with a with a, an actual case underwater, but my cinematographer was against it because he wanted to control more the scene. So a tank, because they had used that tank before, uh, it worked well, but still it was very hard to do because it's five meters deep. So the window is about two meters deep. So they had to really dive a lot to show up in the window uh, where the camera was. So it was pretty hard. Oh, that spec. also, and, and the scene where they go into the sea, that was also very dangerous. They almost drowned, both of them. We actually only have one take of that scene because they basically almost drowned. They had to be pulled out. So we shot this in November with the very uh, strong uh, waves. It was really dangerous. But everybody's That's alive. Yeah, no, I'm I'm, I'm happy <laughs> to hear that because this sounds, this sounds way more dangerous of a film than I expected. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was dangerous, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, good. Glad everyone survived. Glad everyone, uh, you know, emerged healthy and and warm. Yeah, but, uh, nobody got hurt. Wow. <laughs> um, another thing I loved about this film, I love the way the story is told because you don't have like an overarching narrative. Like you don't have like someone at the start that says like the world is ending, people are leaving. You just kind of have to find out these clues and things that are happening throughout is that how you always wrote it was that just kind of like by necessity yeah i like... wrote it as it had to feel like a dream so a, a dream is usually non-linear you just jump in time and you're in play in one place and then you're another so i, I had this idea that the film should feel like a dream it should be non-linear so it's it's actually pretty different from the actual script um because i we didn't shoot a lot of stuff and other stuff we did shoot was were was better than stuff that we shot and thought we would end up better. So we ended up changing a lot of things. Uh, but the actual uh, storyline that you see was made in the editing. It's as, it has really little to do with the, 
with the, the the what I wrote. So actually, the first shot you see, uh, I don't know if you remember, you see like a wide shot right at the beginning of the film where you see uh, Nuno's character floating uh, just in the water, really mm -hmm. from far away. That was actually the last shot of the film. So, but <laughs> I I just decided it looked really amazing that we start off with the dream instead of ending with it. Um, and we changed a lot, but yeah, I, I always I wrote it like this. Uh, I think most of my crew didn't really understand what I was going for because it's, as you can probably imagine, it was a bit confusing in the script, but that's what that was the point. Yeah, no, I, I loved it. And I also just, I'm not going to say hated it because I, I love this film, but like at the end, it's I'm frustrating. like, where, where are they? Like, where, where are they in this kind of like potential storyline? Like what, what, what is happening with so, them? Like, uh, if you want me to probably spoilers ahead. Spoilers, spoilers, uh, spoilers. Let's go. <laughs> uh, so uh, the idea is that uh, you never know if Nunu is actually uh, dreaming uh, that he went into space or if he already went and he's just remembering the past. My opinion uh, is that he is actually just he's actually traveling. So what you what you're viewing, uh, the real time is actually a strip and he's just remembering uh, what you see in the city and what you see on Earth is actually the past that already happened. So the idea is that uh, both of them traveled uh, at some point in time. And when he arrived there, they, they didn't, she wasn't there. So he's looking for her. And, but since they went together, they shared a, a dream because they were in, cryo, in cryogenics or cryostasis or whatever. Um, and they stayed together dreaming. So that's why he tries to find her on the planet. So that's, so, that's kind of... That's, yeah. that, was, that was my thoughts too. I thought that they were in transit and you mentioned in the film that like, that they, they could connect and interact with the people. So either they met before or they met on there and kind of crafted this background based on their life experiences, but also their kind of shared journey. Yeah. So uh, at, at originally it would end with Nunu not finding her and just uh, basically laying down or and or floating on water, not finding her. But I thought it was more interesting me to reveal. Okay. Uh, it's they're traveling. That's what I show it is that there's a trip happening and there's a, a journey that's beginning. Yeah, no, definitely. I, I completely agree. And this is a perfect time to ask about these actors. Like uh, I loved uh, the, the two actors. Um, where, had you worked with them before or? Uh, was no, kind of... I, um, uh, I hadn't. Uh, I had seen films with them. Um, so our, our film scene is actually pretty small. You can actually get in touch with people directly. So <laughs> my, that's yeah, amazing. you yeah, for example, for Maria, uh, I, I could get her contact from uh, friends of friends or for an agent, but it was pretty simple. You just go on Facebook, Maria, I'm Carlos. I work for this production company. I'm friends of this and that. Uh, here's here's the script. <laughs> and she just calls me back and that's it. It's pretty simple. Um, but yeah, I did I did cast. I did try. Uh, it's cast or uh, audition. I did audition a, a few actors, but um so I first picked Maria because she's just done a film with my production company that I love, a short film. Um, and I wanted to do a test with her and I was looking for uh, somebody to play Nuno. I hadn't found him yet. Uh, and all of a sudden, I uh, she, uh, um, she has this friend, which is Nuno, and they're uh, best friends and they've been in a theater company together. So they have a lot of intimacy. Uh, so I do a test screen with her and him and I just love... Um, how he did the scene. So we just, in the, in the audition, we did the whole script. So he kind of knew that I was going to cast him right away because I was <laughs> doing the whole script. I did like the whole script twice. We took like two hours. Um, and then, yeah, I, I, I just auditioned some a uh, few more people that I just already, I had booked before. So, uh, but uh, I just love them and they work. Uh, I wanted mostly somebody that could convey what they're feeling uh, through visuals that they don't have to talk. Mm -hmm. I love people that just gaze into the horizon, the actors that can gaze into the horizon and just leave you thinking. Um, Which uh, you can definitely see like from the poster, like the, the poster with him just kind of staring at you in like this kind of desolate but beautiful way is it was perfect. Like that definitely grabbed my attention initially for, for this film. So. Great, great. And he has a great mustache. I imagine that was probably yeah. an important. No, aspect. the mustache was his. It's not my my. It wasn't <laughs> a character building. We actually discussed if we were gonna uh, chop the mustache off, but it would look too young. He's actually, I think, Nuno is in his thirties. Uh, but without the mustache, he showed me a photo. It looked like Nuno's twenty. So okay, no, definitely not. Uh, Maria was was funnier because uh, actually, when I cast her, she had long hair, really long hair. And all of a sudden, she appears with a, with a, uh, a shaved head because she had just shot a French film uh, mm -hmm. called the the Translators, I believe. Um, 
and uh, she didn't tell me, but I, okay, let's make this work. And it did work. She looks uh, strange uh, that, that I like that. So it, it actually f uh, fits in the type of story. Yeah, no, I think it helps with, like her futuristic feel, right? You yeah. Know, both kind of futuristic, yeah. but also trying to survive. So yeah, and it's super tough for her because she was uh, she actually she was uh, rehearsing a play during the day, and she would shoot at night with her, with us. So, so it was really uh, she was super tired all the time. It was real very hard for her. Yeah, that sounds that sounds rough. Not to mention the the physical harm that she the physical yeah. danger that she was in. Oh my well. god, I I I'm I'm getting too old for shooting at night. <laughs> That's what I realized. It was um, really really hard. And, and I, I can't imagine that there is any sort of sequel to this story because it feels like a nice self-contained one. But any any thoughts on like a sequel to this? Or, or no, essentially... not at all, man. I think this one is buried here. I would like to do another sci-fi film. It's not my next project, but one day I would like to go back to the genre. But no, I think this story is definitely buried. Maybe it can inspire something else in the future, but no, I don't see a sequel at all. That makes sense. I also hope that you do another sci-fi film as well because I, I love this one. I, I'm um... going for folk horror now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to I'm trying to to, to I, I actually wrote a series during the pandemic. It's um uh, probably you don't know this but we have uh, like these traditions. There are uh, pagan traditions and uh Celtic pagan traditions that go way way back. But actually a lot of people don't even know the origins. People uh, dress up in really weird masks and um and a uh, shrove tide I think that's what they call it. Uh, it's during uh, it's when the um, the winter ends uh, basically it's not now it's it's during a uh, carnival it's 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 ma it matches that time so the winter solstice that's it um so there's a lot of small towns really small remote villages that do they have these really weird traditions and it's a story like a thrill that uh, revolves around that and it's a story that that happens here and in the also uh, part of spain because this tradition actually is uh, in the uh, uh, border region so it's a tradition that predates portugal and spain so it's pretty interesting that you can go across the border and they have the exact same stuff uh with very different masks, but the traditions are there. It's just it just exists in that region because it was occupied by Germanic tribes and Celtic tribes way back before Roman times. It's pretty, and it's still there. That sounds fascinating as well. I I can't wait to check that one out. Also, I can't wait to get funding. <laughs> well, yeah, hopefully it won't take ten years. <laughs> yeah, so well, it's it's going well. It, it it's it's looking good. It's looking awesome. good. Uh, so I know we have a very limited time and a hard stop. So I'm going to switch. I call it the lightning round. They're just very lightweight questions about the film. I want to see how your personal experiences map to things in the film. You can feel free not to answer them. I will not be offended, but I try to keep them very answerable. Okay. First question. Can you swim? Yes. Excellent. Uh, what is the longest you've been in the water? I remember when uh, the water swimming or on, underwater. Uh, both. Uh, I remember when I was a kid, I, uh, my record was like three and a half minutes or something in the water. I would practice a lot. Oh, wow. So not not right now, but swimming, <laughs> I have no I have no idea. Excellent. And uh, have you ever had to be rescued from a pool or the ocean or anything like that? No, but I once had a cramp in the ocean where I didn't have uh, I could uh, where I, I I probably would would go down. A friend of mine had to to kind of rescue me, but then the cramp stopped and I but I almost drowned. Yes, once just once. Just uh, a fascination with the sea, apparently, like throughout your life. Just, it's this dangerous, wonderful place. <laughs> yeah, we're, it's it's Portugal. We we have it's part of our identity. Uh, if you could go to space, would you? And where would you go? I would definitely. Uh, I I would go anywhere they would send me. I would uh, probably not. I wouldn't go to Mars because I think I would die there. Mm -hmm. But uh, probably I think either the Moon or International Space Station would be acceptable. <laughs> Yeah, those both would be acceptable and both we probably survive so that, that's a that's a good yeah. call yeah um have you ever hacked into a computer uh I, yeah when i was around 13 or 14 there was was a time i don't know how do you uh, irc you know what uh, it was i was on irc yeah, yeah it, they had like these programs with cheesy programs with uh back back door or something i don't remember the name of the program it was really cheesy i was a kid but it, were, it was a, a person i knew or friends of mine so we just hacked in each other's computers we just would open up the cd-rom drive <laughs> or <laughs> take print screens or stuff like it was probably that was it uh, i love it and uh we talked about the old technology in this film what is the oldest piece of technology that you have and kind of still use that i have and still use Probably I still have um, 
uh, uh, my uh, Sega Genesis. We call it Mega Drive in, uh, in in Europe. I still have it and I still play it. That is awesome. Uh, I love that. That that is uh, fantastic that you still have it and play it. Those classic games are wonderful on the old consoles. Awesome. So the the film came out in theaters on March 10th, 2023, and it's coming to Amazon Prime on March 24th, 2023. We talked about your future projects. It sounds like the the folk horror film is your next one, but do you have anything else on the horizon that people can look for after they check out Infinite Sea? Uh, well, I have actually, um, uh, I have a, a couple of short films, but no, this will be my, uh, the previous short films. One is a post-apocalyptic film. But I think it's very a bit far off from this. Uh, but uh, the next project is actually a series, not a not a fi not a film. I'm trying to do a series with that folk horror story. Um, but beyond that, no, I you have nothing to look forward to. You have to wait. Well, I will I will be waiting with bated breath because I, I loved Infinite Sea and I'm excited to Thanks. see what comes next. Uh, this is Carlos Amaral, the writer, director, visual effects artist, uh, colorizer, and part-time part editor of Infinite Sea. You can check it out uh, in theaters now and on Amazon on March 24, 2023. Thank you so much for your time. This was this was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. That was Carlos Amaral, the writer and director of Infinite Sea, which came to theaters on March 10, 2023 and is coming to Amazon on March 24, 2023. Uh, if you haven't seen my review, I love this film. I really like the storytelling. I love the, kind of the world that it creates. It felt both like beautiful and foreboding it reminded me a lot of Gattaca which is one of my favorite movies of all time so definitely check it out it is an interesting film it has some great cinematography some really good writing and it's also just an interesting story if you like this interview please like and subscribe to this channel it helps me out a lot make sure all my new content goes straight to you thank you <music>